Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. So it's looking a bit gloomy in here today because it's actually raining outside quite hard, but I thought mm, it's raining, it's cold, why not do it right now because this is actually the perfect weather to talk about the story. So it's a bit of a different story today, but I'm not going to ramble too much in the beginning. Let's just get into it. Intended for mature audiences only. So at 4 p.m. in April 2015, Skydiving instructor Victoria Silliers was going to take her first jump in over a year. So the day had been arranged by her husband Emil to celebrate the birth of their son. And then remember I said at 4 p.m. she started her ascent to her skydiving. And then 4.27 p.m. is when Victoria hit the ground after falling 4,000 feet from the sky. Victoria had broken her pelvis, her ribs and fractured her spine in four different places. And she suffered a collapsed lung, but luckily she survived because she landed in dirt that had just been plowed. So luckily Victoria had skydived with one of her friends and he rushed um, to help her. They called the ambulance, they took her off to the hospital and she was still alive, which was, you know, not one of the endings we usually get here. Um, while Victoria was at the hospital, the parachute club that she was associated with. So they, they took her parachute and they looked at it themselves because obviously this was a team of professionals. It wasn't their first rodeo. And they thought that this was quite suspicious because remember Victoria was a skydiving instructor. It's not like she didn't know what, like how to use a parachute. And then the next day, the parachuting club, they called the police to tell them about their suspicions. So the police took the parachute that the club sent them and sent the parachute off to a place called the British Parachute Association. I didn't even know that things like that existed. And obviously they took it there for, for them to investigate as well, because, you yeah. know. But unfortunately, at that time, they had no further leads, so they didn't get information right away. So then five days after this all happened, a very close friend of Victoria called the detective that was assigned to Victoria's case and told her about the really difficult time that her and her husband were having. So this husband that we've spoken about, but you know, I haven't really spoken about, his name is Emil Silias. And when I was, when I heard about the story, I... I didn't know, like, I didn't read into depth about it. And then while I was reading, it, it says that Emil is a South African born, which I didn't do on purpose, just happened to be that way. But he's a South African born, he's very active, he really enjoyed the outdoors, and he joined the British Army in 2004, where he was a personal trainer in the Army. I think he was also a sergeant, but I'm not sure on that. Then in 2010, he met Victoria, who through the army because she also worked there as a physiotherapist and things were going really well they had a very fast romance because a year later they got married in Cape Town South Africa and the a lot of sources say that their marriage happened or it all escalated so quickly because they were both adrenaline junkies they, they really liked the fast-paced life they really liked you know things to go quick and like no chill so four weeks after the incident, the results came back from the British Parachute Association and they concluded that there was no mechanical fault with the parachute. Someone had either tampered with it or it was a third party that tampered with it. So basically, it was either someone who was in that jump with them that day or it was someone else, a completely random, who came in and did it. So what investigators found when they looked at the parachute was that someone had taken the parachute out of the bag. And you know in the parachute they have like strings obviously that attached to the parachute and then to the little baggie, the rucksack. So someone had taken that and instead of leaving the parachute on top of the string so that it can, you know, like, you know, parachute, um, they tied the strings around the parachute so when it came out, it wouldn't just unravel, it would like stay together. And Victoria's parachute, they also have the reserve parachute, right? But someone then cut two cords of the reserve parachute so that wouldn't um, come out properly either. I'm no parachute expert, but they did say that the slings of the reserve parachute were missing. So according to protocol, the parachute must be checked before someone jumps, obviously not by themselves. So someone else has to check your parachute for you. And on the day, Victoria's parachute was checked by Emil. So on the 28th of April 2015, Emil was arrested on suspicion of murder of attempted murder for his wife. And when the, when the detective went to arrest him, he was still at the army, like barracks, wherever he was. 
and um, she asked him, do you understand? Do you know why we're taking you in? And all he said to her was, yes, I understand. You didn't, he was just really annoyed because he said, you didn't have to take me in front of my subordinates. Power trip match. So the first interview lasted quite a long time. It lasted around six hours where they were talking about um, Emil. They were talking about their relationship and their marriage. And the detective said that that was quite weird because usually when people are arrested for suspected murder or suspected anything, they usually try and plead the fifth or they try and call their lawyer because, you know, they're trying to get their innocence, man. But Emil, oh no, he was Mr. Chatty. He was telling everything. He told police that he had a girlfriend. He told them that he wanted to leave his wife, that apparently Victoria had a low sex drive and that was just not working for him. And police said that he, they didn't even ask him this information. He just volunteered to say it all. And also he didn't plead his innocence once. But even though the police were getting all this information and Emil was just word vomiting all of this out, there was no solid evidence that Emil had actually done the crime. So Emil was released on bail, but it was on one condition that he could not return home and he could not um, see his children or obviously his wife. Because the police were obviously worried that if he goes back home, he's going to try and maybe complete what he tried to do in the first place, allegedly. So Victoria was not really impressed with this because she, obviously she was now in a back brace. She had all this pain from the surgeries and she couldn't really move. And she had a five week old baby and she had another child who was also quite young. And she was quite upset because she was like, how am I supposed to look after everything myself? How am I supposed to look after the home and the children myself? But police could tell Victoria only certain things because the crime was still under investigation and they still wanted Victoria to be on their side as much as possible. So police wanted to, you know, tell her some of the stuff because they needed to obviously try and tell her that Emil can't come home, he can't do this, um, but she didn't really get the concept. So they tried to tell her information that would solidify their position in her mind, but also try and give Victoria the information that she is in danger. So she needs to, you know, stop. So basically police told her this information to try and protect her. So they told Victoria that he had a girlfriend, he wanted to leave her, and basically, he also denied the paternity of their newborn son, which would obviously make any person real angry real quick. And, you know, Victoria, she is she angry and police were about to leave. You know, she was crying and they were like, OK, you know, we've told you this, but, you know, let, let, let your anger, let it sit there. So they were about to leave. The police are heading out the door and they say to Victoria, you know, is there anything else you want to say to us? We, you know, heading out now, this is all becoming too much. So Victoria releases a bombshell. So she releases this bombshell and she says to police, you, you know about the gas leak, right? And the cops are like, what gas leak, Victoria? So six days before the parachute incident, Victoria had gone down to the kitchen and she said that she smelt a lot of gas. So she texts Emil and she's like, you know, what's up? Why is this gas smell here? And he says to her, I have nothing to worry about. Don't stress. Don't worry. So she goes around and she goes to the gas pipes that are in her home and she sees that, you know, according to sources, that the gas pipes had been tampered with because there was blood on them and they had really been bent and fiddled with. She texts Emil again and she's like, listen, bro, are you fiddling with my pipe? No, I'm joking, she didn't say that, but I imagine she did. And he's like, no, you know, it's probably erosion, but that is pretty suspicious because according to sources, they had just moved into the house and the house was relatively new. But you know, police being as thorough as they were in this case, they took the pipes and they sent it off to testing. So in order for detectives to convict Emil of the crimes that they um, were trying to prove that he did, um, they needed to build the character of him. Who is he? You know, where did he come from? Who is this guy? So the sources that I read up on said that Emil was very charming. He was very handsome. And when he had a girlfriend, he would put on elaborate displays of affection. And apparently that's how he hooked those ladies in. So back in South Africa, Emil dated a lady. And when they first started dating, she was 13 and he was 16. And they dated for around seven years. And they had a little baby girl together. But once his daughter was born, um, a few months afterwards, he said to his girlfriend that he is going to go to the UK to try and find some work. And he settles down with another woman. And our friend, friend, Emil, didn't even bother telling his girlfriend. No, 
she had to find out via his mother because Emil's mother took this girl in South Africa out for lunch or supper and she told her that way and apparently his girlfriend was obviously shocked she was horrified and he just packed up and left so in September 2015, Emil was asked to come for a second interview at Swindon police station. And here he was asked to talk about the evidence that was mounting against him. Like remember the parachute, the cutting and the pipes now in the house. So Emil, the cops said that when Emil got there, he walked in in a t-shirt and slip slops, like Mr. Casual. So remember in the first interview, Emil gave up all this information about his girlfriend. His girlfriend's name is Stephanie. And when they asked about Stephanie again, in the second interview, Emil started crying. And he started crying because they broke up. And the police were like, um, buddy, you didn't even cry for your wife who was in hospital and in a, like, body brace. But you're crying for your girlfriend. Nice. So basically that interview didn't really give him much. So Emil returned to wherever he was on bail. And the police now had the, his computer and they could search through his computer, his text messages and all those kind of dirty details. And while they were going through his texts, they found um, messages between him and Stephanie from over two years ago. So while the police were reading the messages between Emil and Stephanie, they found that allegedly in some of them that Emil said that after the parachute jump in April, that he was now going to be free. But this man does not chill. So while he was dating Stephanie and married to Victoria, he was messaging escorts at the same time for private lessons, if you know what I mean. So the police obviously needed witnesses and they obviously needed more evidence because they wanted this case to be as strong as possible. So while they were digging through Olivier Mille's texts and all of the information on his computer, it led them to some Salesbury sex club where apparently he went quite often and the people at these clubs said that he was quite quiet and a lot of women would find him creepy because he would just stare at them with these, with these wide eyes. But the women also said that he would push them around. So obviously at these clubs, you still got to respect rules. You can't just go in there and do what you want. And Emil was kicked out of these clubs. He wasn't allowed back in them anymore. So the police finally get the results back for the pipes, the gas pipes. And they found that someone had used a like plier type of tool and tried to bend and um, break the pipes. And that apparently tool was found in one of Emil's stashes. Apparently. So now they asked Emil to come back for a third time for an interrogation. And they asked about the text to Stephanie, they asked about the tools, they asked about the pipes, and now Emil started sweating. And then finally, 17 months after everything happened, the Crown Court eventually found that the evidence was enough to take Emil to court and charge him with two counts of attempted murder, one for the gas leak and one for the parachute. So two years after the parachute incident, Emil was now in court, now 38, and Emil denied all charges. So obviously the detectives that were trying to build this case and the prosecution were stressing because they had no actual evidence that he had tried to break the gas pipes, that he had cut the parachute cords or he had damaged the parachute cords. They had to try and prove that this charming, this handsome, this British army man had done this. So it took seven weeks for all of the evidence to be read out and for the, jur for the jury to hear all of it. But while they were busy you know, trying to be in this court case, detectives found new evidence that could lead to a new type of motive for trying to kill Victoria, which would be that Emil was in a lot of debt. He liked to spend money. He would always ask or make excuses to Victoria for why he needed money. He would say, oh, his father's ill. He needs money for that. And Victoria would give him money. And then whatever money they had, he would spend it. And Emil had taken out life insurance that would cover him and Victoria for any accidental deaths for over a hundred thousand pounds. So by the 23rd day of the trial, they were wrapping up and they called Victoria to the stand because she was obviously the victim. She was the best witness to talk about everything. And this is where everything basically went belly up. So Victoria gets on the stand and she basically says, Oh yeah, I kind of like, lied about everything to try and get my own back to him who had done all these things to me and she even goes on to say 
that she had cut up a good parachute and she had lied in all the interviews and that she had fiddled with the gas pipes herself. So the jury took about four days and they eventually came back with no result. So on the 23rd of November 2017, Emil walked out of that court. Now remember, if the jury is hung, it means that he wasn't found guilty and he wasn't found innocent. I think in some places the, the prosecution and the defense can go again to try and, you know, figure out and try and get an actual verdict. Then on the 11th of April 2018, Emil was brought back to court and after six weeks in court, the jury had finally rested their case and it took three days to find Emil guilty of attempted murder and he was given a life sentence for attempted murder and reckless endangerment of his children and he was given two counts of attempted murder. So Emil will be in jail for at least 18 years. While looking at news feeds and looking at everything else, Victoria has mostly remained silent. She can't really come to grips with the fact that her husband tried to murder her, which I guess is understandable. But yeah, so that's all I have on this case today. It was a very different case. I'm interested to hear what you guys think in the comment section below. But I hope that you found this one interesting. Um, let me know if you want me to do more of these types of murders or attempted murders. So that is all I have for you here today. I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me until this point. I enjoyed the story a lot. Please stay safe out there. Please be careful out there because as you know, there are a lot of weirdos. And I hope to see you again in the next one. Thank you. Bye.